Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I hope you had a really nice Labor Day holiday and didn't eat anything I wouldn't eat. Uh, we will start with just a couple of announcements here. Um, the Food Over Medicine coaching course starts next week. Um, the Diet Lifestyle Intervention course starts this week. You already missed the first class, but you could join us with the recorded version of the first class if you wanted to. And I'm teaching autoimmune diseases this, um, this semester, and that starts next week as well. Um, remember, if you live in the Central Ohio area, Dr. Bregan will be here um, on the 20th to make a special appearance at our free dinner, which will be sold out. I mean, not sold out, that's not the right term for it, but it will be packed because an opportunity to spend time with Dr. Bregan is fabulous. And we are filming lectures for The Heart of Being Helpful, so if you want to participate in an interactive weekend with Dr. Bregan, uh, get in touch with us right away. And if, by the way, if you can't come to dinner in Columbus, we have a live and interactive teleconference version. We can't serve you food, that's the only thing, but we can certainly have a great discussion about health with you because phones work great for that kind of thing. So lots of stuff to contact us about, including careers. And remember, my email address is pampopper at msn.com. All right, so first I want to address some things that you guys email me about because I think this is sometimes easier to um, talk about than to just leave comments on my uh, YouTube channel. So um, some of you are still com confused about the sodium issues. So to clarify, um, when you write and say, but I'm sensitive to salt, so what should I do? I can eat salt. Please really listen to what I'm saying. When I'm talking about the salt issue, I'm not talking about people who have problems with salt eating salt. I'm talking about the vast majority of the population that doesn't have a problem with salt restricting salt. Those are two very different things. And many, many times um, you guys think that I'm saying nobody should do this or everybody should do this. I try to stay away from everybody and nobody and always and never and that sort of thing. So um, the, the, the bottom line is we know that there are people who are salt sensitive. They should not have salt. There are people who are caffeine sensitive. They should not have caffeine. But for the rest of us who are not salt sensitive and not caffeine sensitive, there's no reason to restrict for the sake of restriction. That's my point. Um, and I guess a good comparison would be if you're looking at a cookbook that has nuts in the recipe, you don't write to the author and say, you know, what's the matter with you, nitwit? Don't you know people are allergic to nuts? You just don't use those recipes or you substitute the nuts for something else. All right. Now, another thing that happens is you guys send me links to sites, and I don't post this stuff because I, I, we can't vet everything that you send, and we don't post anything that isn't vetted. That's one of the things that makes us different than a lot of other places. Everything here is carefully vetted by me or somebody who looks at things through an evidence lens that is associated with us. So when you send us links to other sites that, of people that disagree with us, um, I, you know, we, we're putting out evidence based on the to or about the topics that we're, um, that we're covering in these video clips and in all of our classes and that sort of thing. So um, if you're still confused about how to sort this out, um, you should join and let us show you how to do it. That's what we teach people how to do here. So no reason to remain confused. And then some of you are really frustrated because there's disagreement among experts. And again, we can help you sort that out. But, but I wrote about this and there was an article in the newsletter a couple weeks ago about people searching for gurus and then being frustrated when they can't find a guru who they can rely on for everything. I don't want to be your guru. You shouldn't be looking for gurus. You should be looking to sort this out on your own. That's the whole reason why we're in business, okay? And one last thing. Some of you wrote to me uh, in, in angry capital letters talking about Walter Kempner. Um, saying that I should check him out because um, he used salt restriction and had spectacular results. Well, for those of you who cite Walter Kempner, you might want to think again before you do. Um, he was based at Duke University. Before you get all excited about this, Duke University has been the site of a lot of awful things in medicine, one of which was the um, cancer treatment where cancer patients were given high-dose, breast cancer patients were given high-dose chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant. And by the time, and this was on the basis of one doctor in South Africa who published one article claiming that he did this in his practice. It was nothing really but case uh, reports, a case series. And on that basis, Duke University instituted this practice. And by the time everybody found out that this doctor had made it all up, there was nothing to it. Um, across the United States, 9,000 women had been killed and 30,000 women had been permanently disabled. So I don't know that I'd be citing Duke University as the place where fabulous things happen in medicine. 
But aside from all of that, um, let's talk about the rice diet, which was pioneered by Kempner. It was a 1,000 to 1,200 calorie per day diet. Um, celebrities like Buddy Hackett and Shelley Winters made regular visits there. It was sort of like a glorified fat camp. And um, so people would go there and they'd lean down, lose a bunch of weight. I knew some people around Columbus who, who did it too. And then they'd come back home and resume normal eating because you can't live on a thousand calories a day. And they balloon back up again. And then they go back down to Duke and they do it again. Kempner did limit salt, but he limited everything else, including food. The main foods were fruit, vegetables, and rice. So this wasn't some type of controlled experiment where some people were eating salt and some people were eating less salt or no salt. Or This was just a starvation fat camp diet. And when you take weight off this quickly and you're eating nothing but rice, vegetables, and fruit, everything gets better. Your cholesterol gets better, your blood pressure goes down, the weight falls off. But when you go back to doing something that remotely resembles normal eating, Guess what happens? The weight comes back on, the blood pressure goes up. That's why people made regular visits to the fat camp at Duke University. So um, the bottom line is that um, we never use Walter Kempner <laughs> as a citation for anything here because he really didn't do anything that's worth, um, worth talking about. In fact, um, there, there are some uh, things that have been written about the fact that he was physically abusive to his patients to keep them in compliance. And that's not a practice that we approve of here. So. In any case, um, just a little bit of commentary back on your commentary on the continuing debate about sodium, and we'll continue to stand behind the articles that we're publishing, reporting articles in the medical literature that we've reviewed on this topic. All right, so let's get to some content. I guess we have been talking about content, but more formal content. Um, according to a new study, the long-term use of either cannabis or cannabis-based drugs impairs memory. The study was conducted by researchers from Lancaster and Lisbon universities and involved giving cannabinoid receptor agonists uh, to mice for 30 days. It's a type of um, cannabinoid, cannabinoid drug. The mice developed significant memory impairment as a result of the drug and, for example, were unable to tell the difference between new and familiar objects. The drug altered functional connectivity in the brain networks that facilitate recognition, learning, and memory, and also disturbed, disturbed serotonin system functional connectivity as well. Now this study involved mice and not humans, but it does provide some insight into the mechanisms underlying the negative effect of cannabis use on mental health and memory issues, both of the, which have been documented in humans, and I cite studies here that say that. One of the researchers, Anna Sebastio, said, Quote, it is important to understand that the same medicine may reestablish an equi equilibrium under certain disease conditions, such as in epilepsy or multiple sclerosis, but could cause marked imbalances in healthy individuals. Now, research studies looking at the consequences of cannabis use are becoming more important as more and more states are um, legalizing cannabis for both recreational and medical use. When used for medical intervention, cannabis, like all drugs, can cause side effects. And it's important to remember in this light that anything that can have an effect on one system in the body will, by its very nature, alter something else. You can't impact one thing without having a counter effect. That's why all drugs have side effects. Patients should be made aware of side effects before they consent to using this or any other drug. Now, in some cases, when we're talking about cannabis, the risk may be worth the benefit that you're going to get. So for example, in cancer patients, a couple of things. Uh, cannabis has been shown to reduce pain, nausea, sleep problems, and lack of appetite, and also to reduce inflammation, which may help uh, certain patients with certain types of cancer. So I'm certainly not suggesting, particularly in light of my previous comments, don't ever use cannabis, it's terrible. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that you should look at the risks and benefits. What are you using it for? Does it actually work for that? And is what you're going to get out of it worth the risk that you're going to take? It's the same thing that I talk about with almost anything that you're planning to do with regard to diet, health, and medicine. The best approach to the cannabis issue, in my opinion, though, involves some caution. And one of the reasons, and it's a, something I talk about almost every Tuesday and Thursday, is that medicine is fraught with episode after episode in which the medical profession has literally jumped off the cliff all in with treatments or tests or something that has turned out to be useless and sometimes harmful. Some good examples would be vitamin D, useless, a little bit harmful, psychiatric drugs, useless, incredibly harmful. This has partly been due to the enthusiasm that a lot of doctors have for new things, and of course drug company greed, supplement company greed in the case of vitamin D. But consumers have to take a little bit of responsibility for this too. 
Robert Aronowitz, MD, writes in Risky Medicine, Medicine that harm from medical care is partly due to, quote, what he calls a permission condition in which consumers allow themselves to be sold unproven treatments. And so I think that while it's, um, I, I certainly am hard on doctors and I'm hard on drug companies and I'm hard on government regulators and this kind of thing, but consumers have to start taking some responsibility too and not be so excited about the next magic solution for whatever it is that's bothering you and be just a little bit more cautious and checking things out. So consumers do their share to create this medical mess that we all find ourselves in. All right, next topic. It is common for dietary advice to conclude directions to eat a wide variety of foods. The implication in many cases is that it's just impossible for you to be a healthy person unless you adopt a certain dietary pattern, which is true, and that dietary pattern is accompanied by lots and lots of different foods. Um, the government's Dietary Guidelines for Americans includes this statement. Focus on variety, nutrient density, and amount. To meet nutrient needs within calorie limits, choose a variety of nutrient-dense foods across and within all food groups and recommended amounts. So the government uses the term variety in its recommendations a couple, three times just in that one paragraph. Well, at the beginning of my career, and for a very long time, I recommended dietary variety too, and then I started learning more about the dietary habits of healthy people in other parts of the world. And I really discovered that variety is a luxury that's enjoyed by people who live in wealthier countries like we do here in the United States, not a necessity for health. For example, over half of the calories in, in the daily diet of the Okinawan population are, are derived from sweet potatoes. And sweet potatoes, green leafy or yellow root vegetables, and soy are served at almost every single meal. So they specifically have a lack of variety on their diet, yet they are very healthy people. New research confirms that variety is less important than previously thought, and that furthermore, and I thought this was really interesting, that many people who eat the greatest variety of foods also tend to eat more junk foods. And another thing that has been observed, the more variety in the diet, the higher the calorie intake tends to be, and the more weight is gained over time. A lot of studies have shown this to be true. In one study, subjects served a four-course meal made up of different foods ate 60% more calories than when they were given a meal that was made up of just one of the foods that was served as part of the four-course meal. And another study, offering similar sandwiches with four different fillings, increased calorie intake by 33%. Even offering a meal with three different pasta shapes instead of just one increased intake by 15%. The lead researcher in the newest study, Marsha Otto, says that people should worry less about variety and more about quality and that ultimately what counts is the amount of densely nutritious fruits and vegetables one eats, not the variety of foods in the diet. Now, first of all, it's possible to eat a diet that has a lot of variety of foods and doesn't include junk food and it doesn't have to involve overeating. But I think there are a couple of important take home points for people here. One of which is that it might be easier for overweight or obese people to take off weight if they're eating simpler diets and simpler meals. We have all experienced overeating when lots of different foods are available. Good example, how many of us have been to a buffet, including a vegan buffet, where the, everything looks so fabulous and we try it all and then later we probably ate more than we would have if there had just been one meal served. I have done that at a lot of conferences and um, I can afford to do it once in a while, but I don't like to overeat, but because the food's there, we do it. The other thing, so, so fewer choices sometimes can lead to a little bit healthier eating pattern. The other important point is that a lot of people trying to convert to more of a plant-based diet um, often have a very limited palate for plant foods. They're just not accustomed to eating them. And I've, I've had people in my office say, I understand that it's a good idea to do, but I really like pizza and steak and french fries and, you know, fried chicken and all that stuff. Well, they, this shouldn't be viewed as an impediment. Um, instead, simple meal plans can be developed that maybe only include 10 or 15 foods, um, which are pretty well liked. I mean, you can eat a lot of bananas and apples and potatoes and green beans and corn and peas and uh, rice and foods like that. It doesn't have to be red lentils and black quinoa in order for people to be healthy. And then later on, you know, people usually become a little bit more adventurous and that's fine. But even if they don't, the limited diet does not really hurt anybody. So as we continue to stress getting the dietary pattern right is much more important than the consumption of any particular food or any variety of foods. 
Now, for those of you who might have some more interest in the cannabis issue that I talked about just a few minutes ago, um, advanced study for September is going to be on this book, The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids. It's a textbook, and um, I'll try to make it interesting. Actually, I think it is interesting. I've been looking through it in preparation for our workshops. And um, we'll talk about the, the good and the bad. So I'm gonna, I think it's time, because there are so many people living in states where um, cannabis is, is uh, okay for at least medical use, and uh, I think eventually every state will go this direction. So I do think we have to look at this. So this is the advanced study book, and if you wanna participate in advanced study, or you're interested in any of the other things that I talked about at the beginning of this broadcast, send me an email at pampopper at msm.com. We'll get back to you and tell you how you can get involved in anything from this workshop to careers in healthcare and nutrition and that sort of thing. All right, don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you don't already. There's a little thing you can hit subscribe, hit the little bell that's there, and we'll, you'll be notified every time we post new videos, which we do almost every week of the year. And um, as usual, pass this on to everybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you next week with more news.